Welcome to the Haitian Heritage Museum, Black Women in Art, part toi. And for you guys who don't know what toi is, that's three. I'm translating it. Um, but I'm super excited. And um, this is Art Bands of Art Week. And um, again, we had our opening show yesterday for the solo exhibition of La Suite de Salle with Sabrina Gaston. She should be here any minute now. And um, we want to thank all of our sponsors, Florida Arts and Culture, um, African American um, Preservation Network, Magic City Innovation District, and Art of Black Miami, and Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. So like I was telling you guys, my name is Evelyn Pierre. I'm the executive director and the founder of the Haitian Heritage Museum. We've been around, we're gonna celebrate 20 years. I know I started when I was two, you know? But, um, <laughs> but no, seriously, I'm so grateful and I wanna be thankful to God because he allowed us to be in this art industry for 20 years. When we started, we were on the Art Basel panel, there was nobody of color. We were like the first black and Haitian person on Art Basel. And that was when, I guess, 9-11 um, um, happened, and then it was very interesting. So since then, we have been fortunate enough to be in the space. And like I said, I just love opening and giving opportunities to other people, other women, men, anybody in the space, because I think it's so important. Because again, you always have to look back, because I think our we are a community people, and we've got to always look back to capture everybody else. All right, so enough of talking, and we're super late, but um, we're going to get started. And I'm going to read the bio of our moderator, and once I read the bio of the moderator, she's going to come up, and then she's going to read the bios of every other panelist, and they're just going to come up and take your respective seat. Anywhere is fine, okay? So um, our panelist today is Michelle Grant Murray. She's a choreogra choreogra choreographer. Choreographer, I can't say the word. No, I, choreography, choreographer. I just read the bio. I got tongue twisted. An educator, author, scholar, performer, and artistic director of Alajuma Dance. Did I say that right? The Alajumi, Alajimi, Alajimi Dance Theater. She earned a BS degree in dance education from Jacksonville University, an MA degree in African Studies from Florida International University, an MFA degree in choreography from Jackson University, Jacksonville University. Michelle has presented work throughout Europe, Asia, South America, the United States, and the Caribbean. She's an associate professor and professor and coordinator of dance at Miami Dade College, artistic director of Jubilation Dance Ensemble. She is the founder and the host of the Black Artist Talk, founder and executive director of Artistry and Rhythms, AIR, Dance Conference, co-founder of Florida Black Dance Artists Organization, and author of Beyond the Surface, an Inclusive American Dance History. So put your hands together and give it up for Michelle Grant Murray. And she will be your host for today, and she'll take it away. Hi, everyone. How are you? Good. So thankful to be here today. So um, we're going to move forward because time is of the essence. It is important. It is very precious. Thank you all for being here. I want to um, say thank you to Evelyn Pierre for this process. I don't even know how she found me. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm like, okay, um, we're going to make this work. I have no idea, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. And thank you and congratulations on your 20 year anniversary. That's a long time and that's a lot of work inside of this city, Miami. Miami is an interesting city to live inside of. And it's a very interesting city for black women to be successful. So thank you and congratulations. I am thrilled and excited with this opportunity to work with these young women that I'm working with today that we're going to have a conversation with. This is an amazing experience to engage, explore, and educate ourselves and have a great experience with them today. Um, the Miami Design District, thank you for the use of this building, the process. Um, I've lived in Miami for this time 25 years, and so I remember when this wasn't here right um and i've seen lots of changes even in the week in this week you know those of us that live here know how things pop up quickly so i'm excited to be in the space excited to be next to jonathan Stoltz gallery space for those of you who live here you know who he is if not good 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 google 
And so we're gonna get started. I wanna introduce and read quickly the bios of those artists that we will be working with today for this event. And it'll be a quick read and we're gonna get started. As I call your name, you may take your place on the stage. If you need me to help you up, I can do that too. V. Harrison is an award-winning journalist from Chicago's West Side. Her work appears in publications across the entire nation, covering and highlighting black culture and black narratives. Harrison is a local and international change agent, an influencer setting the stage for new voices in media and black communications. Thank you, Vee. <laughs> Fabienne Rousseau, born and raised amidst the vibrant streets of Miami. I am a visual artist whose work is captivating, exploration, who's captivating an exploration of the intricate evolution of graffiti, calligraphy, through the eyes of abstract expression. And she recently told me that the birth of her daughter softened her up a little bit. So let's see what happens. That softening can also be very intense. Candy Lopez was born in Bayonne. Did I say that properly? Bayonne. Oh, that's Creole. Bayonne, New Jersey, and currently lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She's a teaching artist that also has a keen eye for marketing, management, and education. Alina Mirage. Alina Mirage is a fine arts professional from Trinidad and Tobago, currently based in Brooklyn, New York. Mirage has, a, has 15 years of professional experience in the arts, working across both primary and secondary markets. She manages a women's artist and consultant group for four galleries with locations in Brooklyn, London, and Lagos, Nigeria, on the other side of the river. Ashe. So please welcome our panelists. I have to try to sit down. I don't usually sit down like that, but I'm a dancer and a choreographer, so my legs are always, my legs and feet are always moving. So, and I'm gonna move this to the side so I can see your beautiful faces. Hi, ladies. How are you? Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. So if you can briefly um, share with us, and we'll give you five minutes each, if you can share with us how you came to the art industry. What was that pivotal moment that brought you to the art industry? Starting with it. It's on. Is it on? Is it on? Hello. Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for having me here. Um, quite an honor to have the platform and meet everyone. Um, so my art professional journey, you know, I'm an artist from birth, but I would say I graduated college with a studio, um, a bachelor's in studio art. And, you know, coming out of college, I'm thinking, stomping around Chelsea, New York, which gallery is going to show my work? Which gallery am I also going to work with? And very ambitious goals there. And I learned very quickly it took a lot to, it takes a lot to run a gallery. So um, right out of college, I started an internship at a gallery called Ameridian Gallery based in Soho, New York. It's a contemporary South African gallery. We represent about 60 artists and designers from the sub-Saharan region of Africa. So that was quite a learning curve from um, educating not just myself, but collectors on what contemporary African art looks like, um, how to run a small gallery business from the ground up, um, how to actually creatively brainstorm solutions on the go with crisis management. And it really um, is where I found my voice in the contemporary um, African arts. So I also most recently graduated with a master's in art business from Sotheby's Institute in New York. And thank you. And that really inspired um, my business, Papaya Projects, where I represent artists and also consult for galleries. So it's a hybrid approach and really trying to empower from the ground up. So that's kind of a, a little bit on my journey. Thank you, thank you. 
Good afternoon. Are we in the afternoon? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Honored to be here. V. Harrison, my, my background is actually in journalism. And as I told the ladies before we got started, I always, when I am surrounded by artists, I have to give the disclaimers that I am not an artist in that way. But then my fellow panelists here checked me real quick and said, well, if you are a writer, you are indeed an artist. Um, and Dana Ty Pope in the audience, shout out my good friend Dana Ty Pope, artist here, invited to Scope, uh, told me once that if you can get words on a blank piece of paper, it's no different than getting images on a blank canvas. And so it's interesting because I went to a private art school in Chicago and I did not expect to do so many of the things in art that I'm currently doing because again, my background is in journalism. I'm a writer, I bleed ink. And I had no idea that I would be among so many artists in my older years. But from going to Columbia College Chicago, there were artists all around me. I didn't recognize that I was an artist too <laughs> until many of them started kind of relating to me in that type of way. Um, so many of them were dancers. And I took a yoga class senior year because so many of them were dancers. Some of them were painters. Some of them did interior design and graphic design. And then I realized like, okay, so we're all artists. And it started to settle. Years later after graduating, I to find freelance with Pigment International, who I'm here with. Shout out Pigment International. Um, Pigment was here last year as just audience members who were among the crowd listening to this Black Art Women Talk, and now we are on the stage. So thank you so much, Haitian Heritage Museum and Evelyn for inviting me. But I think the pivotal moment was writing for Pigment and traveling around the world. Um, the 59th Annual Art Biennale in Venice, Italy. Uh, the, the 154 in Marrakesh, Morocco. And realizing that I was surrounded by art and artists and really embracing the fact that I was no different. And the words that I do write about in publications like Pigment International and our magazine just really makes it clear to me that it is really all the same. So I think as I'm starting to come into this realization that I am indeed an art artist myself as a writer, I also have mad respect for people who that stuff on that blank canvas. So I think it's just kind of evolving uh, myself as I grow and my understanding of where I fit in this space. And I'm happy to be in it. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming out. Thank you for to be a part of this impactful panel. Um, creativity has run a thread through my, the roots of my family tree. I have visual artists, uh, performing artists, all through my family tree. So I like to say that from day one, I've always been a creator. It's my natural instinct. However, getting into the professional arts uh, started when I started volunteering at MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art in North Miami. Um, they are a wonderful institution focused on African diaspora and Caribbean artists and uh, giving also emerging artists the opportunity to show their work. So. Working with MOCA is really how I got my start. I volunteered as a docent. I got hired onto the team. I did tours uh, and eventually ended up becoming their museum educator. Um, and after they broke off with the city of North Miami, uh, I was one of 10 employees that was whisked away to the design district to start ICA Miami. So yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, <laughs> it happened so quickly, I, I, I tell you. Um, so yeah. In the blink of an eye, another institution, we started from the ground up. So I was museum educator at ICA here in the design district when all of this was under construction a while ago. We were across the street at the Moore building. And um, it was really a pleasure also working with DACRA and seeing how they run such a, a, a tight ship uh, in, in the design district. And then after uh, ICA, I transitioned into the classroom and became a full-time art educator uh, at Gulliver Preparatory and I taught high school there. And <clears throat> after six years of teaching, uh, after the pandemic, I left and I, I was presented with a really cool opportunity to become the programming manager of the Winwood Walls. So I started the education department there. I was in charge of hiring teaching artists, creating a curriculum from scratch uh, and being a visual artist as well. So I created workbooks, coloring books for all of my students 
uh, created a history of graffiti class, brought in tours from Breakthrough Miami, Handy, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, all of these awesome organizations and created field trip programs to expose them to the arts and to teach them how street art evolved from graffiti. Uh, and then I, after having my beautiful daughter, I transitioned back into the classroom and that's where I'm at right now, uh, teaching again, sixth grade through 12th grade now at Ransom Everglades. Oh yeah, <laughs> middle school. That's a whole other animal. <laughs> that's for another day. <laughs> that's tough. Oh, it is. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, again, my name is Candy Lopez. Um, I feel like I got into the arts in middle school uh, I went to Norland Middle, which is in Opelika, Florida. I'm originally from Jersey, and I moved down when I was nine. And I landed in Hialeah, which was totally um, different for me. Um, so when I, when I went to school at Norland Middle, and they had a magnet program for the arts, um, because I couldn't act, you can read my face anywhere. Um, music, I like to hear it, but I didn't want to play it. And Dance, I tried dance, so I was in magnet and dance for a year, and then I was introduced to ballet, and I'm like, yo, my body doesn't, <laughs> doesn't contort like that. <laughs> so I used to draw Pokemon a lot. It was just something to do as all little kids. So um, I feel like Norlin and the teachers there really developed the technical aspect of art, and I love challenges. Like, I'm the third child, so I'm a little, like, the weird one in the family. Um, so by the time I got to high school, I went to New World School of the Arts, which is in downtown uh, Miami, which is totally different from when I went to school. Um, and there I knew like, okay, arts can be a career. Like the teachers were really interested in pushing us to go to the top art schools in the nation. Um, so I got into MICA, which is Maryland Institute College of Art. I didn't like it, I, I did graphic design. I'm not a person that can be on a computer, I need to like make with my hands. And then um, the market crashed and I had to come back home. So I ended up at USF in Tampa and I studied business and that was really depressing. So then I, I ended up double majoring. So I got my MS in marketing and management just in case I was gonna go into the gallery realm and also painting because it's what I love. Um, and while I was in my undergrad, I was like, I want to teach because it allowed me the time to create, but also have a full-time job. And if I, at some point, wanted to have a family, that would be like the route to go in. And I love teaching, like, I love teaching. Not little kids, not middle school. Um, I teach at Nova Southeastern University, which is in Davie and Fort Lauderdale. I am the associate professor there for the art and design program and also the program director. So I know the heavy toll when it comes to doing that. Um, and also a mom. So I have a five and a three year old who I'm also pushing into like the art world, but who knows what'll happen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very inspiring information, particularly for me. So we have a second question and I'm gonna start with V with that question and we'll just go around with that. As a creative person, it's hard to balance creativity and economics. Or do you create with the belief that if you build it, they will come? So we're thinking about economics and the level of creativity, the have, the have not. How do we make it happen? You just can't be a creator without being a hustler. All right. It's just synonymous, right? You just, if, if you are an artist of any type of art, you a hustler. Like you are, you are constantly thinking about your vision, you are constantly calculating. I'm up in the middle of the night, bright early in the morning, late at night, and it's not just because I'm a mother, but it's because I'm a hustler slash creator. And so, so much of that, you know, it, you can't do this just for the money. Um, we all gotta eat, we all have to live. But you can't just do this for the money, but kind of like you said, if you build it, then they'll come. If you've got the hustle and you've got the passion, you'll get the bag. It's really just that simple. And, and it's not, it's not a, I wake up in the morning and I think about writing these articles or I think about 
um, making these press releases and getting these things done because I'm not hungry for the bag. Uh, I get up to make money and survive. But I don't think those things could happen without the passion and the drive. And if you are a creator, you a hustler. There's no other way to put it. In most cases, we are the best hustlers, if I do say so myself. Because something that the women and I were talking about before you all arrived was the fact that black women, we are just always multifaceted. All right, I don't know one black woman, woman that does one thing. We always do a bunch of stuff. It is just natural in our backbone that we do that. And as mothers and as, as lovers of our families and nurturers, the world calls on us in such different ways. And so just getting the bag is just one part of it, right? That's the easy part, really. But waking up with that drive, you know? You won't always wake up with that drive, right? Sometimes I don't want to write. It hurts. I can't even believe I just said that. But sometimes I don't feel like it. So that's when that discipline comes in, right? And so, so much of that is the hustle spirit. And I think our generation, uh, millennials beneath, I think so much of technology and in modern ways really has redefined that hustle. I mean, we look at Beyonce and Jay-Z and 50 Cent them, and we, we look at their hustle, but there's just a really local, mainstream, run-of-the-mill hustle, just getting up and going to get it, right? And I think that that's one of the really important aspects. So you, you cannot thrive without the hustle, and if you're a creator, you already got it. Thank you. Agreed. Um, I believe it's a balance of both. You do have to hustle. However, as an entrepreneur, and when I started uh, my passion project of creating my own brand, which I do uh, have, um, it's called Fabstract Inc. It's all of my artwork on streetwear and prints, etc. So, I mean, that's a passion project. I didn't create that with the intent of just retiring off the funds that I was going to make. I, it's a passion project. Project. It's something that I've always dreamed of, to see my artwork uh, transition from, from 2D to 3D um, items. And it's, it's really a dream come true to, to see. I'm, I'm inked up with my artwork. I create like, everything from shoes, dresses, phone cases, you name it, my artwork's on it. And yeah, that, that hustle spirit is really there. Um, and I also teach, so it's really about that balance. Like you, I do have to have that steady income, especially to provide for my family, but I always have to keep my passion and my spirit fed, and that's very, very important. I can't just settle and, and settle for a non-creative job in order to provide. I still need to feed that creative spirit of mine. Um, I don't think we have the luxury to not hustle, especially as minorities, especially of like minorities who have immigrant parents. Um, you, like you have your grandmother who did so many jobs, who fed the community and whatever island or place they come from. Um, and then your mother who transitioned into coming into the US as a teenager and learning a new language and figuring out the system and seeing that hustle. Um, and hustling can be an issue because we also have to take care of ourselves um, and learn to relax when we need to relax and then to switch up when it's time to work. My dad, is, it comes from military so like, I have the hustle mentality from my mother's side. Like they have all kind of energy. Like the minute they wake up without coffee, it's like, and I'm just like, good morning. Um, and, then, and then my father's side is like extremely militant. Like I'm up at six, getting the kids ready. Dad takes them to school. I'm studio mode until it's time to be in professor mode and then be in mother mode, and then again, studio mode, because I need to like make. Like that is something I need to do every day. If you want a happy candy, like I need time to be in the studio because that's what drives me. And I think a lot of it too is not just like, 
you have the talent, so all of a sudden you're going to make money. I think you have to be business savvy as well and, and learn how to get out of your shell. I think a lot of the times it comes to networking and who you know and so-and-so knows who and sees your work somewhere. Um, so being able to, I don't want to curse, have your stuff together um, is important and to be ready when the opportunity comes. Um, because if, if you get the opportunity and you're not ready, that's an issue. So I think we, we work constantly and we have to chill just for our own like mentality. Yes, um, definitely echo the same sentiments, ladies. Um, for me, when I'm working with artists, you can, even if you look at the artwork, you can tell when a work is created under duress. Um, I really started papaya projects with the artists in mind to liberate them of those constraints of feeling like I need to bartend and do this and that X, Y, and Z. Um, all of those things are necessary, but if you're wrapped up with this pattern, you're not going to allow your time to be in the studio and you don't actually need to create to be creating. You can just be grounded in your purpose. So I really think it's important as an artist, sit in the dark room, look in the mirror, you know, survey yourself, where are you in your career? What is your mission? What is your purpose? How are you impacting the canon of art as a whole? And when you actually start to work backwards, things will find you. As Fabian said, how one thing led to the next with the windward walls, etc. For me, I'm working in so many different disciplines gallery, um, the primary, secondary markets. I also have a private studio practice. I definitely feel the same way with candy. My sketchbook is in my bag. I need to sketch every day, without a doubt. Five minutes waiting for my coffee, longer in the park, et cetera. You just know where, what you're trying to get out, right? Um, and stay grounded. It's infectious, and things will find you um, one way or the other. There's a lot of opportunities out there for artists, from grants to fellowships, residencies that actually want you, just come. It's not even a definition, like you have to have an output from this, like create five works from being in this residency, but it's allowing the urban artists to come to the countryside see, try a new medium, explore, stay curious. So I really think it's important to, you know, sit down, ground yourself, find your purpose, and understand what is your mission. It will always be evolving, that's okay. Um, just be honest about um, what you're dedicated to pursue. That's beautiful. Thank you. Is my mic on? Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Pen to paper because your DNA actually resides on that thing and you can shift some things. It's called conjuring in the narrative. So I've heard hustle, passion, balance, sustainability, which equaled thriving. We are not afforded the luxury not to hustle. I love that. Self-care, networking, business savvy, welcoming the opportunity, and then I thought about how does the conjuring manifest, how does the conjuring actually happen and the manifestation of all the things. And the sitting back and going to the countryside and actually sitting inside of nature to do the work. Nature actually energizes and inspires us. So we have to have a little grass, some trees, the, the clouds, the wind. It will speak to you, allow it to speak to you for the creative process. And the relaxation part of that, the breathing, just breathe. I love that. You're so calm. I love that. Thank you. So we have um, two more questions. How are we on time? 
timekeepers. How are we on time? Okay. So we have two more questions to get through. So if you could uh, tail your answers down just a tiny bit, thank you. They're great, and we, want, we need to hear everything that you have to say. Um, and we have to be conscious of time as well. The arts are often is described as a catalyst for cultivating community development, civic engagement. How do you see your unique work impacting our community? And so I want you to speak to your community and to the community of South Florida because you all are coming into South Florida. And that's interesting for us, for the people that live here because we call it <laughs> The implants, they're not really from Miami, but they do come to Miami and, and work. And there's something to be said about the environment of Miami as an artist. There's something to be said for this space. So I'll start with Candy. <laughs> well, I was raised here, so, but I was born in Jersey. Um, I came when I was nine. I'm a professor, so my community is about education. Like, it's important for me to educate my students on what real history and art looks like. When I went to school, it was a lot of that European white canon art history with like all the Ninja Turtles. And it didn't really talk about like the artworks that other places have contributed during that same time comes to teaching art history or even like when I give assignments in class it always has to deal with their identity like a lot of students that go to Nova are from diverse populations so it's important for me to educate myself about them and their community and what their identity looks like but also for them to showcase and share with the class so a lot of the times my assignments have to deal with identity and a lot of the times I'm also doing workshops for the community because I want the community to be able to, I'm a fiber artist at the moment. Um, so a lot of the times when it comes to fiber work is very tactile. A lot of people want to like try it and see if they can do it, which is fun for me because I'm just like, I invented it. So it's just like, I don't know if I'm doing it right or not. <laughs> um, but it's nice to have the community come out and like work with me. I, it's important for me. I, I love meeting people and for people to ask questions and, you know, it makes me happy. Just to piggyback on that as again, um, <laughs> you have good, made some really, really good points. And since we're both educators, our worlds are, are really intertwined. Um, what you say all, like, really resonates with me. I, the community that I share, it's South Florida. I was born and raised in Miami. Um, I'm, I've always been involved in art education, whether it's teaching middle school, high school, uh, field trips. I think it's very important to represent my background, my Haitian background, I'm a woman of color, and I think representation, it just, it, it, it goes really far. And when I decided to become a teacher, I decided to become the teacher that I always wish I had and I never had. So that. Okay, <laughs> and I think uh, I, I, I pride myself on, on being a good example for the children that I, I share my work with, that I share my practice with, that I share my knowledge with, and I think it's so important for them to see a positive example and to, to understand that anything that they want to do is possible because the world has completely changed from the time I was a child. I'm 43 years old now. <laughs> and and let me tell you, it's, the world has changed. I'm and I've changed. You know, I'm teaching digital art, and I think it's very important for. I'm a digital artist at the moment as well. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I think it's important for for the youth to understand that you can transition, you can change, you can evolve. It's part of the process, and and it, and it's also a part of doing research and understanding history, and. It, it, involving history into your work as well. Yeah, that was a good lady, thank you. Um, so it's funny that you should mention, Michelle, the, the inspiration of the nature around you. And I just recently, very recently, just a little over a year ago, I moved my family to a little country town from the hoods of Chicago. 
I'm talking the real hoods of Chicago. It's where I grew up. I'm talking uh, roaches, rats, prostitutes, crackheads, like the reality of urban life growing up black and underprivileged. And uh, so much of my storytelling came from there. I wrote my very first book almost three years ago called Hood Healing. And intergenerational trauma was the focus on that book and how so much of what we know centuries ago from slavery um, of our people is still a part of us and how that trauma resonates with us on a day to day and we don't even realize it. And so community for me is the hood. Um, you didn't see art in the hood like that when I was growing up. You didn't know artists. Uh, something that Dana Ty Pope would often tell me is that she didn't see people who did what she wanted to do when she was growing up. She didn't see brown skin artists and women that was painting or doing gallery shows. And so um, unlike these ladies who are real teachers, I did do an after school instruction for like six years of my life where I was an after school instructor and I taught inner city youth journalism. And uh, so much what they don't know, they don't even know they don't know because they have no exposure, no culture, no resources to get there. So when I think about my life in the arts um, and where my stories come from and where I draw my inspiration, so much of that is the hood, right? The gutter, where people typically don't get those opportunities and young black kids don't get to go to the local art institute or across seas to cover what they want to do with their lives. And so, yeah, living in a rural town right now and having my children so distant from what I grew up around is very different, but also very inspiring. Um, I draw a lot of my thoughts from nature and the land and spirit, but the hood is where it all came from. Um, right now, where I am in my career, it's a very full circle moment. You know, um, I'm 15 years in the gallery world, uh, just graduated with the masters, and as I rose, you know, you're looking back. I moved back to, uh, I grew up in bed Brooklyn. Also, the hood, all of those characteristics we lived with. And coming back to the neighborhood um, with more academic eyes, so to speak, I'm looking at um, what's on the walls, what are the opportunities for the artists. Uh, three of the artists that I manage, one's in the audience, Miss Dee Dee Lovelace. Um, all of my artists are based in Brooklyn. Um, just happens to be that way. Uh, the gallery, one of the galleries that I consult for is in Brooklyn, um, focused on emerging artists from the region as well. Um, so everything's pretty full circle, fulfilling for me at this stage. Um, I'm really bringing what I learned at school and through my career and looking back and giving those opportunities, um, letting people know about different resources. I love being a dot connector, opening up someone's mind on collecting to even artists, um, trying new mediums. You're feeling stuck? Try some ceramic clay or something like that, some clay. Play, you know, it's a playful industry you know, um, in my own practice, I'm working with crayons and watercolor. That's all very cerebral. So it's really important to um, invest in the artists, invest in the community, um, expose people and inspire. And um, we're doing it each individually and we're, we're stronger together as a whole. Thank you, yes. I love the concept of play and change. Um, the background of where you come from, your foundation is absolutely essential. I, as a choreographer and a dancer, I'm just gonna put my two cents in there. I always ask students, my students the question of what's the cultural dance of America? And they come up with all sorts of, all sorts of things. Sometimes they say, oh, it's ballet. No. <laughs> um, and I, I feel that the cultural dance of America is actually hip-hop dance, right? 
um, everybody wants it. And it comes from the hood, it comes from the streets. So, right. so the brilliance is actually born in the hood. Like, who capitalizes off of that, that is another thing. But the brilliance is actually born inside of the hood. So we can never lose sight of that. Right? We always have to stay connected to what that is. When they start talking about urban, that term urban, we have to realize that they're talking about black communities. And where do we take and how do we claim that ownership of our own work agency for the work that we actually produce that's coming out of the hood? Where's that inspiration coming from? So we can never lose sight of that. Thank you. Um, we have one final question and then we'll keep moving from that. What is the one thing that comes up as a creative that you would like to leverage or that you feel should be leveraged to boost careers? The one thing that comes up as a creative that, should, that, that you would leverage to boost a career, what can you offer the audience today? And I'm going to start with Fabian. I think young artists need to really uh, do their due diligence and research. I think there's a huge lack of knowledge and this is my personal take on it because I do teach the, the next generation and I try to push uh, research as much as you can. Learn about different genres, learn about different cultures, learn about the history. You have to know your history in order to move forward. You have to, it's imperative. Um, and I think that's what the younger generation is lacking. Um, that and a little bit of that hard work ethic um, now that we're living in this social media world, I think the hustle can be misconstrued with likes and shares and social media posts and, and that quick come up and I think longevity in order to leverage like a real career with longevity, you really have to do, put in that work, put in that research. I'm thinking about the question. Um, maybe connection. Um, I feel like a lot of us going back to social media are like wrapped up on our phones, including myself, like spending time answering emails and reading things. Um, but once the phone is down and we like have to have a conversation because we're in a room, which is one of the things that I like love about going to like a dance show or a, or a uh, music performance, because you have to put your phone away, even though some people are, you know. Um, but being present and like connecting, I think is really important because one day that's gonna be here, I don't know when. Um, and we need to learn how to talk to each other. That one thing that I would encourage artists to really hone in on is time. I think it's the one element that we really, really take for granted. And the more people in my life that evolve out of my life or pass away to the new realm, it makes me realize even more how important time is and how we take it for granted. And we always think we got so much, right? And just who are we to think that? And we always tend to think that there is another day to get it done or another minute that'll pass by that'll be kind to us, but it's just not the case. And I think as artists, one of the ways that we capitalize is we take advantage of our time, you know, very wisely. And I've been <laughs> told ever since I was a child that I don't sleep, much hasn't changed about me. And <laughs> it was just always said that as a kid I was just nosy and I wanted to know what was always going on. But I think as I've evolved in life, I realized that I really value time. You know, I just really value time and, and, and being able to have minutes in my day that are just for me, that are for the people that I love, and time to just get things done. So I think that's what I would really encourage people to hone in on. So for me, it really boils down to the art of collecting. Um, a lot of people are, whether you're intimidated by it or you see it as a six-figure, you know, um, 
valuation, you can't get in and collect anything. I think it's important for creatives to collect your friend's work, barter. Um, through collecting, you start discovering different mediums. You know, um, indigo artists from Mali to collecting can be um, a fashion or a fashion item, so to speak, or a necklace. Um, there's different ways of going about it. Um, when you're visiting Paris, you get that souvenir keychain. You can get that same sentiment through a painting of street artists. Um, I think collecting is super important. It doesn't have to be expensive at all. Um, work with the galleries. Try to figure out how can I do an installment plan with the artists. Go to the art walks. Stay curious. And collecting really has been um, a profound experience for me. Um, when I look around my walls, you know, you're creating your own gallery, so to speak, in your own home. And um, through collecting as an artist, through collecting other artists' works, you are being part of that change. You're impacting, you're supporting that other artist. Um, naturally, you're being exposed to other curators, um, other opportunities. It fosters that nurturing kind of ecosystem, that, communi that communication that you speak of, Candy. So don't sleep on collecting. <laughs> I think you had something you wanted to say, Candy. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, when we um, arrived earlier this morning, we were having a conversation around collecting and collecting Candy's work and the value of the work three years ago versus today. So <laughs> we should think about that, this idea of collecting. And there's a way, there's yeah, a there, way. Where there is a will, there is a way. Where there's a will, there's a way. So we have a few moments for a Q&A, I think. Um, does the audience have any questions? And I hope you do. Inquiry, yes. I'll take the microphone to you. It's okay, no problem. Yeah, I've been moving artwork, so my back is not nice right now. But um, my question, so Issa Rae has a, a saying, she talks about um, instead of networking up or always attempting to network up, you network adjacent. So how has networking adjacent helped you in your career? Because I'm a big proponent of looking out for my people. Um, and I just find that it always circles back to help me at times, you know, when I, you know, I'm looking for the next opportunity, next opportunity and someone I've mentored comes to me with an opportunity. Um, so how has networking adjacent worked for you in your career? It brought me you. <laughs> you all, Dana and I have traveled the world together and um, literally a 10 year difference you wouldn't even know. And I remember when we first uh, went to Venice, Italy together, I was like, Ugh, I don't know this girl. She better not be tripping. You know? <laughs> International, we didn't know each other like that. But when, when, you, when you travel with someone like that and you network with people like you said and Issa says that are adjacent, it just gives you an opportunity to see yourself a little bit and I think that there's always this idea of networking and like you said moving up and going to the higher ups who've got the bigger bags and the more experience or reaching behind you and grabbing people that have failed or are not doing as well but that adjacent networking right that getting with people on your level is very special and it's magical and I think that when you find your people your flock you are relieved because especially in the creative world, because growing up, we're so different. So when you find your people, it's so special. So I think that creating and networking and connecting with people that are adjacent to you is special and necessary. For sure. I was just off the phone with my homegirl, who's, um, I consider her a triple threat, um, museum, manager, and also artist. And we speak pretty fluidly on areas 
in all three disciplines. Um, sometimes we're in the dark room screaming into a pillow together, but you know, it's still a, you're still able to um, seek that support, seek that sounding board um, for advice, um, not just in the art world, think of just creativity in general through music. Um, my partner is in music management. So there's different elements that you can pull from um, across the board. We have trailblazer women in the arts like Thelma Goldman, Larry Stokes Sims, who really created that pathway. You know, you, networking is organically going to present itself when you stay curious and you get out there and have that dialogue, that conversation um, with something you truly are passionate about. So I think it's extremely important. It's a great question. And um, you're touching where you can and supporting um, your peers as an artist or professional in whatever um, discipline that you're within. Can we have one more question, please? I think we have time for one more question. We have time for Okay, one more question. Yes, ma'am. If you can introduce yourself, I'd love that. Peace, everyone. My name is Kayla. I also go by Empress Ka. Um, my question for you ladies is, how do you all connect spiritually to your art or to your craft? If you feel connected spiritually to what you produce. Um, <clears throat> I'm spiritually connected 24-7 to my work, to my ancestors, like, always and always. I, I think it's just important to exist in that fashion, otherwise I cease to exist, period. Um, I think sometimes when you think it's a accident, um, is when your ancestors are talking to you. Sometimes I like make decisions and I don't know why I make the decisions within the work, but then like a week later I come back and I'm like, that's what I was trying to tell myself. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with trusting your gut. Like there's reasons why you do what you do. Um, and, and you might not know at the moment, but like moments later or years later, Things just connect, um, and, it, and it comes full circle. Another thing I wanted to say about the networking question is to take opportunities even when you think that they're not important. Because you do not know who will be there and who knows who. Yeah, I'm like, I had that. The smallest things turn into the biggest things. I learned that this year. Um, in relation to spirit, um, it, it's, it's all around us and I can't, I can't imagine writing without it. A lot of times when I'm writing, it's from under stress or emotion. I wrote my 100 plus page book after losing my only brother to gun violence. So a lot of that is really sparked by emotion and spirit. But um, I am very much moved by spirit, and in, in essence, I feel like most of the times it's more in control than my actual body, to be honest with you. And when I'm writing and sometimes talking on a panel, I often feel like I'm more spirit-led than body-led. And I think that that's important to tap into that when you're a creator, because you're doing it for yourself, but also for the people. And so I find that to be very important. So cr the creation process, um, what I tell artists, um, everything that you're making, you know, you treat it autobiographically, what you're putting out. I'm in my green period right now. You know, I'm, I'm trying sculpture. It's all autobiographical. You're leaving your imprint of where you are, the COVID work, you know? Um, that is very much part of the sacredness when it's going back to the spirituality that you're pouring into the work. Um, I had to learn very early um, the mistakes. I'll crumple up. I used to do watercolor um, paintings and 
you know, that's fluid, but sometimes, you know, it goes west and I wanted it to go east and I'll crumple it up. And there, there was a time where I had to actually, you know, instead of crumpling it, just put it away, revisit it. And that's understanding that this work is sacred. This was created in this manner, my head space at 1 a.m. at night, you know, fair enough. But um, just allowing it to be and um, allowing yourself to really pour yourself into all of your creations, mind, body, and soul. Thank you. I, I would, um, as an educator and a creator and an artist that does many things, particularly for young people, I would encourage you to explore your spiritual spaces as much as you possibly can. It's a very powerful space. And speaking from the lens of a black woman, the very thing that colonization and, and um, this Western canon has cut us from is the very thing that they need to move forward. So <laughs> even when we're talking about climate change, gentrification, carbon footprint, water ethics, all of those things are connected to the spirituality of nature. So those um, concepts, ideas, characteristics, practices, processes, research tools, research investigation, all of, the, that, all of that language is essential to who we are as a people. We need that. If we allow that Western canon system to control and direct our path, then we lose our power. So work inside of your power unapologetically, wholeheartedly. And I understand that I'm a very radical person. I just told my friend the other day, I get more radical every day that I break, that I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I gotta control myself. But I can't, I can't. Cause once you go forward, you can't go back to that, right? So really, really explore that. Have some fun with it. Allow the bird to speak to you. Ashe, and so it is. Thank you, thank you. I think we have to transfer, transition, correct? Everybody can stand up, you guys. Give it up for them one more time. They were amazing. Just in case you get on the stage, get on the stage as well, please. So um, we wanted to thank our guest. I know um, when they say when you come before great people, you should always have a gift. So um, the photographer is like um, signaling you guys. Can I get the artist to come up really quickly? I want you to get in between them, but yeah, go ahead and get between. This is the artist. You guys are gonna see her work later. This is Sabrina Gustin, give it to her. She got stuck in traffic. She's supposed to open up with something, but she's gonna close out with something. Alrighty, so um, I don't know what colors you guys are. I'm gonna let the Holy Ghost lead me. So here. <laughs> All right, um, so on behalf of our sponsor, the Greater Miami Convention and Visitor Bureau, they wanted to give that to the young ladies. And um, we hope you guys really enjoyed yourself. I'm gonna jump in the shot really quickly, but I hope you guys enjoyed yourself and please stay. We have a whole lot of breakfast stuff. We even have some Haitian patty. You guys wanna check that out. And then of course the artist here, and then she's gonna close us out with like two poem she's also a spoken word artist she's a photographer she's a visual artist so she's doing all those things somebody said that like we do multi -factic. one more and then um I, i'm sorry yes i don't take any of this i give it up to god because when you were talking about spirit and i'm a, a, a devout christian and i asked god give me an idea that's going to glorify your name and help the haitian people and clear as day he said haitian Heritage Museum. So people come to me like, why didn't you call it Haitian American Museum? I'm like, well, that's not what God told me. He said Haitian Heritage, because heritage, because we have Chinese Haitian, we have Jewish Haitian that they pay $5,000 to become Jewish, to be Jew, to go into Haiti. She said that last night. A lot of people don't know that. So I wanted to say heritage, so that's all encompassed of all the beautiful things that the Haitian people do. So I'm gonna get on the stage, take the picture, and then right after that, we're gonna hear the lovely Sabrina Gaston, give it up again one more time. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Gustin. Um, thank you so much for coming out today. I can't hear myself. You can hear me? Okay. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, came here to Art Basel to uh, present my exhibit. It's called La Sud, the South. Basically highlighting the people, the culture, the music, and just everything lively about the Haitians in the South. Um, so the premise of the entire exhibit, my mother is from the countryside, and growing up she was very uh, stigmatized against because Northern Haitians, um, as you all know, it's more you know, preferred among some people, especially today when it comes to tourism, when everyone talks about Haiti or when the media talks about Haiti, they glorify Cap Haitien or anywhere around the capital. And um, this is something that I wanted to highlight and showcase and basically show what type of beauty that we have because we're more than just being um, negative images in the media. And I didn't want to exactly make the exhibit to dispel that because I know how beautiful Haiti is, but this is just to showcase and just to show everyone what we are about. So the first poem that I'm going to perform, it is called Honor the Honor. So the premise of this poem is basically to highlight what Haiti has been to a lot of nations around the world, which is often forgotten and just not known in general. Um, so Haiti is responsible for the independence of Greece. Haiti is also responsible for the independence of Colombia, Peru, Panama, Ecuador, and Bolivia. So I'm a little nervous, so just bear with me. <laughs> 19th century, she was just a baby. Success in her DNA, strength rested in her bones with potential sweeter than her sugar cane. She housed freedom in the corridors of her womb and then gave birth to children who would soon forget her face. Sacrifice and liberation means nothing if you forget the one who has nursed you out of your chains, your mother's chains, your grandmother's chains, your great-grandmother's chains, and all of the wrists and ankles that have wept in agony generations before they did or ever could. Bounded by courtesy, your lineage knows peace across oceans because of her. Her children got older, became much wiser, and grew into great nations who would forget and lose their ability to remember her whenever they are in trouble. Honor thy mother. Thank you. That was just a warm up. The next one is really good as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> so this next poem is called, Don't Forget Her Diaresis. Now, a lot of people, when they write the name Haiti or they say the name Haiti, it's often butchered. Or when they spell it, it's without the first I, which has the diaresis, the two dots on top of the I. Um, a lot of this is also done in the media. A lot of it is also ignorance. So writing this poem, I channeled all of the microaggressions growing up. I have four siblings, I'm the fourth of five, and they have pretty unique names. I like their names, and growing up, they were also made fun of because of their names. And I will always remember, this will always stick with me. A kid in my class came up to me, you know, random conversation, why don't you have names like your, your siblings? Why do you only have a normal name? So then I responded, their names are normal just as well. Well, I never heard anything like that. So that microaggression just stuck with me and just also growing up seeing how they were ridiculed for the uniqueness of their names. And also I tied it into Haiti's name in general. How, I don't know if anyone here is Haitian, como yo salopete nonu in the media, the way they bastardize our culture, everything that we're about. So don't forget her diaresis is a part of that. When they write my name, they forget my crown. They actually forget it twice. When they say my name, they spell it wrong. 
butchered with holes and a lot of ignorant bites. It's as if the name pains them. It's as if gravel has taken place of their tongue and strangled every last bit of intelligence that they had left. Disgusted by the sound, they say whatever they can, yet it is still so hard to get it out. They choke over my eyes and forget the cross of my T's. But when they say my name wrong, they then blame me. So say my name, say my name, and get it right once, not twice. For I am the one and the first who knew how to fight and brought those stranglers to their knees. So when you say my name, say it right and say it with ease. Haiti, I-E-T, capital H-A, diaris is I-T-I. Thank you.